Tchau, bom, bom dia. <risos> bom dia. Bom dia. Bom dia. Bom dia. Bom dia. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a great privilege and pleasure to meet you. And uh, on behalf of the group, uh, we feel very, very grateful for the generosity of your valuable time. No, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm very excited to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you. And I haven't yet had the, the, uh, the, the chance to talk to a group of, uh, uh, of practitioners and thinkers from Brazil. So this will be my, my first conversation. And I'm really excited. Oh, fantastic. Well, as I mentioned, uh, this is a group uh, composed by business and thought leaders of many of Brazil's uh, leading companies. And under this uh, leadership program, we are debating critical issues every month uh, based on a book that is selected to serve as the framework for this, this, the discussions. And today uh, we're talking about your wonderful book, uh, Humanocracy, in order to respond to uh, the broader question of how can we create um, organizations centered on people and not on bureaucracy. So perhaps Dr. Zanini or Michelle, if I may. Um, Michele, yeah, call me Michele uh, or Miguel, whatever. Or, or Michele. Or Michele, forse un po' più giusto. Eh? Um, okay. <laughs> perhaps we could start uh, with some of your thoughts um, about your iconoclastic, timely and superb book. So thank you once again. Okay. All right, well, thank you for those compliments. Uh, I'm not sure they're fully deserved, but anyway, I'm, I'm glad you, you, found it, you found it useful. Um, I guess I, should, I could start very quickly. I, I know there are a lot of interesting uh, uh, questions and I, I'd actually love to get your reflections as well from, from the group, having engaged with, with, with the content. But I would say that maybe start with a personal reflection that you know, both Gary and I, uh, over the last few decades, developed a um, Gary Hamill, my co-author, a um, with whom I've been working for the last uh, twelve years, um, have developed a, uh, a same conviction that basically large uh, established organizations all over the world, irrespective of country, irrespective of sector, uh, and so on, are not as capable as as they they should and, and frankly need to be. That you know, uh, as I said, whatever the country sector, it, it just seems to us that large organizations have some core incompetencies, right? And, and that and they're just not as resilient as they need to be. They can't intercept the future. Um, that of, often is, is actually well known in advance. They're just incapable of doing the pivot to, to, to adapt to it. They're also not particularly innovative. I mean, there are companies that are innovative for sure, uh, but the number of companies that are able to repeat the innovative act over and over, you know, where innovation isn't just a, lucky uh, product of having stumbled on a cool initial you know service or, or product idea but is rather the product of a, of a system that churns out innovation on a constant basis that th that's quite rare and that you know organizations are just not filled with with with, with passionate people um, if you look at the engagement statistics you know from Gallup and others they show that a small minority of, of, of workers is is deeply engaged and I think the numbers for Latin America are not very I mean they're I think over the global average is 15% are highly engaged. And I think in Latin America, it's, it's, it's even lower than that. So, and, and if you read, you know, that part of the book where we talk about why this is a big deal, you understand that that you know, leaves a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of value on the table, right? Because you can command people to be, uh, to show up at work, to be competent and maybe take accountability for the results, but you can't command people to use their imagination, right? To give, to give the 110% and required to, you know, bring something amazing to life for the customer or for other stakeholders. And, and so you, you have, you look at these three kinds of incompetencies, you know, the, uh, the inertia, the incrementalism and the emotional insipidness of, of, of these organizations. And then you ask yourself, okay, what, what's at the core of that? Is it their business model? You know, is it how they go to market? Is it their operating model, the way they, you know, have IT and, other platforms and you know their distribution channels and whatever, and we don't think that those are are the issues. I mean, the the issues are have to do with the the management model, which is something that often doesn't get talked about a lot. But we think it's the fundamental driver of long term success, sort of how you lead or manage and organize an institution, uh, because that um, uh, creates the environment that either helps people give their very best or not, right? And most of the time, it's not. So the whole book is really focused on 
uh, trying to, and, and Gary has been on this mission for even longer than I have. And, and it's interesting because he came at this, and I kind of did as well from strategy. So he came at it from why, why do companies have such crappy strategies that are very undifferentiated and why can't they just reinvent themselves? So he came at it from strategy and then he realized, you know, the, the limiting factor is, is the organization, right? So, so the whole book is really premised on that. And then what we try to do is give people a sense of, of how, how they could start to change their management model, given the fact that that's, the, that's what they need. You know, we think that's really the priority number one for most large organizations, you know, being as, being as radical in reinventing your management model as you are in trying to seek innovations in your business model. You know, trying to do what Amazon did for retailing uh, to, to your organization. So, you know, something that is like, you know, maybe unthinkable for most people, but then, you know, creates this amazing advantage. And, and so, you know, we took quite a bit of pain and, and maybe you, you thought that, uh, you know, the, the beginning where we tried to uh, create the articles of impeachment, right, for, uh, for bureaucracy to be a little too detailed, but we really wanted to get people to understand, you know, link these maladies, these incompetencies to organizational factors in a very precise way, give people a sense of the cost, right? Because unless you understand, the cost of bureaucracy is often hidden, right? Um, people feel feel that there's there's a problem, but they don't necessarily have the metrics to, to quantify it. So having people, equipping people with some tools for thinking about this is a really expensive uh, management model that we have, then we wanted to give people a sense of, some interesting new models, uh, alternative models where you can be big, uh, but also very unbureaucratic. You can operate with very few layers of management. You can operate in a, you can have a lot of control and consistency and coordination without a lot of people, you know, in managerial positions doing the control, the consistency and the coordination, right? You can just have uh, this happen in, in different ways. So we have the Nucor and Hire example. You know, Nucor is a steel maker, Hire is an appliance maker. So we're not talking about Google or like some company that has only PhD, you know, white collar PhD uh, employees, right? These are, you know, blue collar, blue collar uh, organizations. And, and, then, and then we have these principles, these seven principles. And, you know, what was important for us there is to uh, highlight the fact that while you can learn what companies do, like what Hire does, what Nucor does and, and whatever, what's more important is how they think, right? Because all these companies were rebuilt or, or built to begin with, with a completely different set of values and ideas about how, you know, how they should operate, you know, and, and, you know, if, 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 if a bureaucracy has, you know, the, the principles of standardization, specialization, stratification, and so on, formalization, you know, there's a set of principles that we need to invent for new, for the new kind of post-bureaucratic organization that they are different, because if we don't start from different principles, we're not going to get very far. Right, so I think there's a lot of tendency in in management to just do benchmarking and copy what other other organizations have done, and 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 I think that's you know I understand that that's a um, well-intentioned effort, but often it falls short because if you're just trying to cut, cut, cut and paste someone else's practices on your organization, you know you're not going to get very far. It's always going to be superficial because you know, the principles haven't really changed. And so you might have the appearance of being a little bit like Spotify because you created, you know, squads, tribes, and guilds, and whatever. I don't know if you're familiar with the agile model of Spotify, but a lot of companies have tried to copy that. I don't think very successfully because, again, they're just cutting and pasting. Um, you, need to, you need to go much deeper. So, so we tried, you know, every principle <laughs> was... In fact, if it just you know, we thought we were have one chapter in principle at the beginning, and then we said, "Oh no, this needs to be much <laughs> bigger." So the the book the book became much lo longer, uh, which the publisher didn't really like, but it became much longer because we thought, "Well, no, these need to be, you know, in depth, and we need to kind of start from outside of management. Like, why is this principle powerful?" Then I have examples of companies that have taken that principle to heart and show the, and show the, the performance improvement. And then the last part, and I'll, I'll stop here, and then we can go wherever you want. But you know, we so you know, you want the motivation. You want people to say, okay, we need to change. You want to give people a model, you know, uh, or at least a set of principles to say, okay, there are alternatives, right, to to this bureaucratic status quo. 
But then, you know, even if I got you to that point, then you might still say, okay, but like, I'm not like higher. I'm, I don't have, you know, the, the CEO of hire who's like really motivated to do this. Um, and it's, you know, it's really complicated to change an organization that is so, so large and filled with all this, you know, baggage from the past. And so how do I get started? And, because, and, and so like the last part of the book is really about, about that. And, you know, uh, I, I love the Michelin example. It's a very humble example. You know, they will be the first ones to tell you they're not done. But it shows you how this could start like very easily and then roll up. Um, and, and then we have an example from Adidas. I think we, we may not even mention that it's Adidas, but it is Adidas, I'll tell you, uh, about how they, they tried to create a conversation across the entire company on how do we become more innovative. And so instead of calling like a McKinsey or Bain, BCG to say, okay, help us become, create an innovation function and innovation culture, they, you know, they went to their, their employees and said, okay, what do we need to do? And they gave them some inspiration and then they started generating experiments, uh, prototypes of management practices that were tested in a part of the organization and then, and then they scale. So the whole logic of changing that way, I think for us is very powerful. That is, uh, and we can, get, we can com come back to that, but the, the idea that you, know, you can have revolutionary goals, that right? you wanna ch you know, change the, or the DNA of the organization, but you can get there in very, revolution very evolutionary ways. You can have experiments. You can you can prototype these practices. You know they're not given to you by God, right? The way mm -hmm. we do strategic planning, budgeting, someone came up with that at some point. It's not like a immutable law of uh, physics. You know we can change that, right? It just because you know best practice is to do this kind of budgeting process doesn't mean that it, it, that's the only way you, you do it. So so and then there's a piece which you know could have probably had more meat, but we were limited by, by uh, time and space, but really around changing yourself because you can change the institution. And we are big believers that in a way, a lot of the management literature is almost too focused on pop psychology and this notion that you need to, you know, you can self-improve, right? And, 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 to, and, the, and neglects the system in which people operate so that you can do all the individual self-improvement you want, but if the system is geared towards a complete set of behaviors, you're not going to get very far. So I'm, we believe that the system is important, but on the other hand, it, the change does start with you as an individual, and it is a pretty significant challenge, both for the people at the, you know, with in positions of power who need to kind of unlearn a lot of new behaviors. Uh, I'm sorry, unlearn old behaviors that are toxic and learn new behaviors. And it's also hard for people further down in the organization who, you know, have have spent uh, decades with this learned helplessness, like that. I there's nothing I can do. Um, and convince them, no, no, you can actually be a change agent, right? You, you can actually make a, make a positive difference. So, so the individual change challenge is really important and needs to be part of it. So I just gave you a bit of an overview of like why in the hell we wrote this book and, and some of the main, main points. Uh, I hope this is kind of helpful as a, as a way to tee things up, but uh, you can just uh, uh, take it where, where you want. Yes, uh, fantastic, uh, Michelle. It's been a quite a, a very nice um, review of the, this thick book, as you say, huh? and uh, which is uh, basically a, a manifesto against bureaucracy. It's very interesting, uh, interesting your critique and with the data and everything, and also this manual for creating uh, humanized companies, even with an idea that we have to change the way organizations change, as you, as you say, and, and it starts with us, with this, um, uh, bureaucracy detox, as, as you mentioned, right? Um, so my, my first question, I, I'm going to kick off with a question and then I'm going to open for uh, the audience. Um, so uh, given your um, iconoclastic um, nature of this uh, book, um, my, my, my doubt is how your ideas have been received uh, by senior managers and board members uh, during your talks and workshops around the world. So uh, do you believe, uh, believe that most or at least, uh, let's say, um, a fair number of them are truly willing to dismantle their bureaucratic management models and to reinvent themselves according to the humanocratic uh, principles that you propose? Yeah, it's a good question. And the message isn't a very easy message for people to receive. And uh, we were talking to the CEO last week of, of a large, one of the largest uh, fashion companies who liked the book and said, you guys are really tough on CEOs. <laughs> really <laughs> tough on the senior manager. Yeah, we are, we are. Um, 
So, so some people might say, ah, oh, you know, not for me. But I have to say that um, more and more organizations and, 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 and C-suites are realizing that, you know, the old model isn't working, right? It's just not working for uh, shareholders. It's not even working for employees. It's not working for society. And so there's more, I think, more of a readiness to embrace these issues than before. Um, you know, the, I think even though, you know, and often like the CEO, the CEO probably gets it more than other people in the organization. The problem is the CEO doesn't know how to make the change happen. Right. Um, and so I, you know, the, uh, the idea is that you know, what the, our council is, you know, you don't have to figure everything out. You just need to create an environment where people can start to question these things and invite people to help create a new system and a new organization. And with that, you know, you can unleash a ton of power and it doesn't have to be something that you architect and it's super high stakes. And I think a lot of them are getting it. Um, so I'm hopeful for the future. Uh, but as you say, it's, um, it's not, um, it's not an easy pill to swallow, but, 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 I, but I, but I do think that there's more readiness, and in a way, the pandemic was a, a terrible disaster and tragedy. But I, but I, I think that people are are not under, understanding how inhuman a lot of our large organizations are, and how that needs needs to change. So, so I'm hopeful, but, but yeah, there there is definitely, you know, a trade off because you 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 know, if you want to write a, a book that is you know pleasant to CEOs, you're not going to write a book that where we say we need to like dismantle bureaucracies because in a way that's they sit. They sit at the top, right, of the pyramid. So it's. it's a, but yes, and and this idea that you propose that there is an ethical imperative at stake here because this system dehumanizes uh, people and, and limits their possibilities. In my opinion, it's very strong. It's very relevant uh, for our times. So Angela, uh, would you like to make a question? Yes, well, buongiorno, professore Michele Zanini, mi chiamo Angela Donage, coordino questo programma di Leadership with Alex. È un onore stare con lei, grazie per il suo grazie. tempo. Uh, well, usually, uh, based on your book and on your knowledge on Mary Parker Follett's ideas and work on Quincy in Boston and the suburbs uh, when we have marginalized people, uh, thinking about diversity and inclusion in corporations, um, the people, usually the people that are excluded from the top management positions, such as women, people of color, LGBT communities, and Latinos, etc., are the ones that could be more prone to be the activists that you uh, show in your book. Uh, first, because they usually don't uh, fit and benefit from bureaucracy, but also do their, the, to their perception. Uh, out of the box from this system. The problem is that these minority groups usually don't have the power to make the changes or even to speak and be listened to. Uh, either they can speak, uh, but they, they are not listened uh, by the ones with power. So uh, there are two questions. How to be a hectivist from when you are uh, from a minority group that usually don't have the voice or um, you are not listened because when you're not listening, you either disengage or you leave, right? And yeah. the second one is how to make leaders uh, start value the power with, not the power over, uh, like Mary Parker said, and harmonize and include and not standardize and homogenize. Uh, uh, how how to, to make this happen and to make uh, leaders value this? start this power with? Yeah, those, boy, those are two big questions. Um, let me, uh, and very important ones too. Let me just start with the, maybe the, first, the second around leaders. One thing that I've seen um, work successfully is not to take leaders through some sort of traditional training program where they're told, okay, this is the old way, this is a new way, you need to kind of change it and it's like internalize this and whatever. But so like thinking your way into a new way of acting, but rather the reverse, you gotta act your way into a new way of thinking. And so, you know, uh, situating um, people with positions of authority in completely different contexts and experiences and having those be um, 
uh, moments of awakening, uh, uh, you know, where they have a, almost like a personal epiphany is, is really good. I mean, there's, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, so in Michelin, and we may talk, about, I don't know if we talk about this in the book, maybe we do, maybe we don't, but basically what they did, they wanted to increase responsibility of and autonomy of, of production teams in factories. And these production teams, about 40 people per team, they have a supervisor, a manager, and, uh, and managing, you know, it's like managing three different shifts, or, you know, across, across the day. And, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge was, what, what can the, how can the supervisor reimagine his or her role to give, to give teams some, some, some more autonomy? And uh, the, the way they did that wasn't by, you know, training them, as I said, in, in sort of like, here's how you delegate, but rather putting them in a position of saying, okay, what is it that we need to do differently? And one of the things, one, in one of these teams, you know, so the, 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 the supervisor said, what, what, what do you guys, what do you guys want to do that I do? Right, so that was his question to them, and they said, uh, "We don't know what you do, Olivier." His name was Olivier. We have no idea. You just come here. You give us like the instructions for the shift in the morning. Then you just go and disappear. I don't know. Maybe you go to like the cafeteria or just go, you know whatever. We don't know. So, so what they did is they ended up shadowing. They shadowed him for three days, so they kind of get a sense of what he did, and then he ended up uh, being involved in the shifts. So he saw. He saw the world from their perspective, and they just, they saw the world from his perspective, and then based on that, they just said, okay, well, you know, maybe we can do scheduling and staffing on our own, and and production planning while you focus on mapping talent capabilities for the next year or whatever other, other things. So, so they ended up renegotiating their roles and responsibilities in light of concrete like experience and and you know and so on. Um, the other thing that they do very um, uh, is is also having. Uh, making making this a collective journey. So in a lot of these factories that had different supervisors going through this kind of transformation, so they created these peer groups so that they could um, they could like keep each other honest and deal with, you know, like talk about the struggles that they were facing, how they dealt with a particular situation. So you create a bit of a peer group that keeps you focused on this journey and is supportive of you. So I think, you know, which doesn't mean that training isn't important. And they do, they did some pretty clever training as well. Like you need to have some tools, like how do you give feedback? How do you delegate? Whatever. That's important. But, but I think what was more important is just making this not a theoretical exercise, but very experiential. So I, I think, you know, you got to start there. Otherwise, I don't think you're going to get very far. So that, that's on the leadership. In terms of being an activist, I mean, yeah, I don't want to go off on a tangent on that, but you know, the, the thing that frustrates, not, not frustrates me, but I wish the conversation about diversity and inclusion were much broader, uh, where we talked about different kinds of inequalities inside of organizations, because for sure, uh, there are inequalities related to representation of certain groups. But there's also a, a fundamental inequality that is vertical, it's hierarchical where you know the power is distributed in very unequal ways and the people at the bottom have very little say have very little voice and and there are all these level, level levels between themselves and 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 those who make the decisions and so they just can't find a way can't find a way up and um you know so I, I wish diversity and inclusion statistics also talked a little bit about you know hey can we reduce the number of levels can we distribute decision-making power further down in the organization? Can we align compensation with productivity improvements and so on? I just, uh, you know, so that's just like one, one piece uh, because I just, uh, you know, I, I think it's good to have uh, the C-suite that is more representative of the population in which the organization operates. That's like, of course, right? Uh, who wouldn't want that? But on the other hand, you know, um, maybe the question should also be like, why should we have all those people at the top getting paid? I don't know. Three two thousand times more than, than people at the bottom, right? Are they that much more valuable, right? So anyway, so but that's a separate talk, conversation. Uh, in terms of the activists, if you are that's at the bottom, another you, that's another hard thing to swallow, right? <laughs> this this but, CEO but honestly, that you must talk with. Yeah, but on the other hand, like there's no way around it. Like if you, I mean, just to, to me, the fact that you talk about you becoming a diverse. Uh, an egalitarian organization 
with 2000 to one pay differentials, I mean, like, how does that, how is that, who's going to take that seriously? I don't know. I mean, right. To me anyway, I just don't, uh, even, okay. even at a place like, even at a place like Google. So the, the CEO who's not be under flag because the company is not doing that well, uh, or it's not, you know, it's big, in, a little bit more, uh, less dynamic than it used to be in 2019. The, the guy, the guy is uh, Sun, Sun, Sunyar Pinchar, I think is his name. He got paid a thousand. The, the pay differential was a thousand to one to the median employee at Google. Now, the median employee at Google is a knowledge worker with degrees in computer science. And other, so, like, you're talking about very capable people. So, is 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 the and the justification is somehow the CEO is doing, you know, the people at the top do more complex and challenging work. So, my question is: Is the CEO of Google doing? work that is a thousand times more complex and challenging than your uh, like your your median employee at Google I, I don't think so like I, I don't I don't know how you could you could argue that but anyway sorry let me just go back I took a tangent but let me go back to your question about activism no, perfect this is going right no, but it's right like, in the center of the like, question the more we, inclusive we're not because we're yeah there yeah. are the ones yeah. with less hierarchical uh, levels yeah or, or if they if if they have levels, you know, yeah, the differentials are lower, and the, and the people that play those roles in, in supervisory roles are very much supportive as opposed to command and control. Like at, at Southwest Airlines, uh, which is by the way very inclusive in the sense that you know they uh, you know they don't do layoffs, uh, they have profit sharing plans, uh, everybody's trained how to understand the numbers of the company and so on. They do have supervisors, so I'm not saying you need to have like zero levels, but the supervisors, in a way, are influenced very heavily on the feedback that they get from the people that they're supposed to work with, and you know their their approach is very much a coaching approach. And if they're if they start bossing people around, those people don't stay there for very long. So, anyway, but to your point about activism, so what do you do if you're in a in a lower down in the organization and you're like in a in a group that is uh, marginalized? You know, I, I think the you know the our advice would be not to go try to go up because there are those levels there are those all these different people that can tell you no but rather go go horizontally and try to find other people that have your same passion have your same vision and and you know your level unit of power is small but if you can aggregate your units of power across lots of lots of people um you can start to create waves um and and now more than ever you know with the social technology you know, the internet and social media, we can really try to create these little, you know, these movements inside of companies that weren't possible, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And, and you know, and you can start by, I think what's, you know, as you build this kind of horizontal coalition, start to think about how do we measure the cost of, of the current status quo? What is, what is the impact of mm -hmm. this, uh, of the status quo uh, on personal impact and organizational impact? I mean, what, just give another example. The, the, the CEO of PayPal uh, didn't realize that the average employee, you know, the, the, the take-home pay was like, so like what was left after all the expenses were, you know, living expenses were, I think the take-home pay was 10, 12, 10% 10 of whatever they were making. 10% could, they could put, they could save. And he, he didn't realize that. He had no idea. And he says, oh my God, this is like terrible. We can't do this to our people, and and so you know, so they changed the the compensation structure and started to pay people a little bit more. But I guess what I'm saying is, you know, you got you got to start by you know showing some like hard hitting evidence of how the current system is unjust, organize a little coalition around it, and come up with proposals that may be quite small at the beginning, but which could be tested, and then kind of build 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 um, build your way through it. And we have a wonderful example in the book, I think, of uh, the National Health Service and how they started this amazing change process around improving patient care. And it was started by, uh, you know, physicians in training. So yeah, there were, there were workers, probably not marginalized groups, but like out of, in the medical hierarchy, they were at the very bottom. <laughs> and they just kind of didn't ask for anybody to, for permission. And they just went ahead and did it and asked people, okay, what is it? Uh, what's your pledge for improving patient care over the next year? And they put up a website and they thought, oh, maybe we'll get a few thousand people to participate. They ended up getting 200,000 people or more um, to just, and it became like a really big thing. And then when it did, 
uh, you know, the CEO of the NHS and the people say, oh, it's a great idea, you know, and they kind of try to appropriate the idea. So, you know, at the end, if this is, if this catches fire, then the people at the top will have no choice but to kind of play along, right? Uh, which is a very different situation had you instead gone, uh, you know, up because they would have told you, oh, this is crazy, you shouldn't do this. Anyway, and, sorry, very, very long, very long answers to your questions, but I hope, I hope so we much. kind of... Uh, Michelle, uh, let's go to the on the, to the other end um, of the let's say the hierarchy. Uh, we have many board members in this group, including uh, independent directors of large companies such as Isabella and Yeda, who are going to ask uh, next. So uh, my my doubt is, in your opinion, what is the role of the board of directors in let's say um, steering their companies so they can become more humanized and purposeful? Can we say? that sometimes the board may be an obstacle for the dismantling of bureaucracy? And how can uh, independent directors in particular support their companies uh, moving towards a, this uh, humanocratic model? How do you see the board on, on this? Yeah, and no, that's a very good question. I think the board could be a huge catalyst for change as, as, as I think investors can to pressurize, pressurize the system from you know, from the, from the top in a way, um, you know, the, the, what I would do is if I were a board member is to ask the CEO, uh, you know, some very simple questions. We have these, the bureaucratic mass index, you know, maybe even start there and saying, okay, well, these companies that are very large, maybe some of them are industry and they're very profitable and very successful. And they have very engaged employees. They operate with three layers, for 30,000 people. They have very small staff functions. Um, they allocate resources in ways that are different from us. You know, yeah, you show us your strategic plan every year, but these companies don't, some of them don't even have a budget. They don't have a budgeting process. They allocate resources completely different. So my question would be to the CEO, it's like why justify to, to me, to the board, why you're not doing this? Why, why are you like everyone else and not these like post bureaucratic pioneers that are proving to be incredibly successful without all this stuff, right? And, and put the burden on management. It's like, explain to me, and it's an interesting, like we were talking to the CEO of, of a large financial institution in the US where they took the number, uh, the, level, level, the number of layers um, from 13 to, to six or seven. So, you know, still kind of a lot of layers uh, but 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 a pretty significant change. And they, you know, what the CEO did was to say to people, every every month we're gonna have a meeting and you're gonna show me, every organization is gonna show me the number of people, number of managers that have like less than five direct reports. And it's, you know, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna tell me how many people are in that kind of situation. And then you have to, for, for those people, you have to explain to me why they have five, why they have less than five. And, and is there a good reason? And if there isn't a good reason, what are you gonna do about it, <laughs> right? So that's just one example around structure, but, but you can just be, you create this challenge and say, you know, why, why question the status quo, question the orthodoxy and, and tell them like, why, why can't you do this? I, I think, and then they'll have to respond. Um, so I, I think, I, I really do wish uh, that board, and it's one of the things, you know, Gary and I are doing interviews with all sorts of people. We're trying to create a point of view and a movement around how do we get management to in a new direction. And we realize that it's not individual management teams or companies that will do the trick. Some, some of this needs to be systemic. And we have a lot of confidence and hope that the, the governance of these companies and the, uh, the investors can play a really big role. Because, you know, back to what we were saying, turkeys don't vote for Christmas, as they say in the US, you know, like it's, it's kind of hard for executives to cut their pay, to cut levels, you know, because levels and, and number of people working for you are correlated with prestige, with power. So it needs, you know, the pressure needs to come from the bottom and from the top, right? So that there's no way to, no way to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Isabella, please. Ciao Michele. Ciao. Ciao. Eh, te la vuole de un romano. <laughs> um, I, I was just uh, curious about when you were talking about the, the CEO does uh, 1,000 times 
what the median employee makes. And then in terms of the PayPal, I thought you said average employee. I, I, I'm not, we don't have that yet, of course, in Brazil, uh, starting to scratch the surface to discuss this. Uh, but I, I always, I, I don't know if, if this, is, this is a calculation of the median employee in terms of uh, the higher frequency of the salary or this is, uh, you know, if it's ever, or if it's the middle between the, the highest and the lowest, uh, how, how is this actually calculated? Because I think this is, this is really, would be really hard to do in terms of, because uh, because we don't know the, the wage uh, of all, you know, of all organizations and companies, we might have some classifications in the Ministry of, of Labor, but, uh, how can someone can calculate uh, what is the ratio we are talking about actually, and uh, and how can we calculate that? How do you guys calculate that in in yeah. the UK and and US? Yeah, so I should say I'm not an expert in this, but um, and it's done differently and it's a little tricky. But in the in the United States, the the Securities and Exchange Commission, you know, the regulatory body for listed companies, mm -hmm. has now mandated. Uh, companies disclose that ratio between CEO and the median employee. So it's something that companies need to report on. Um, and companies do it, as I said, maybe differently. I think the way it's typically done, it's, it's, it's the median employee. So you know whether you include the CEO or not doesn't really matter that much, but um, because it's pretty robust metric. Uh, but you know you have to be careful because, for instance, McDonald's, you know, it's a franchise system. So like, you know, the low em lowest employee is not the guy flipping the hamburger, right? But rather the, the person managing the franchises. So McDonald's looks like a great, you know, great in terms of composition, composition differentials. But if you look at instead the differential between like the McDonald's CEO and the guy flipping the burger, it's huge, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's complicated, but I think it's definitely one metric that is, is interesting and it's gaining traction. I mean, the, the business, um, uh, the World Economic Forum um, uh, has a group called the International Business Council. And last year they came up with a set of metrics around stakeholder capitalism. Some of them were around people, well, most of them were about planet and um, society, but some of them were people related metrics. And one of the metrics was very much the one around the compensation differential. Um, there are some other ones around, which are even more difficult to get around training, training expenditure, uh, degree to which you have profit sharing. Maybe the easiest ones are, the, you know, back to the question earlier about uh, uh, marginalized communities are around representation of, of, of specific segments of the population and companies. But to me, that's like baseline, right? That's like sort of, of course you want that, but you, you got to go much further. So. Um, one of the things in these interviews we've done with academics, with uh, CEOs, with thought leaders that we've done over the last, and hopefully well, I'll, be, I'll be able to share some of these with you and, and the broader world in about a month. But a lot of people have come back to this point. We need to measure these things so that they become salient. So we need to measure the cost of, of disengagement, of apathy, of, of sclerosis, you know, not just by the way human, the human cost, but the corporate cost, right? Uh, but and then we need to kind of force companies to start reporting, like how are they doing against some of these metrics? And you know, I I, I do believe that that's going to be important. And you know, and and you say you know, the government, like the SEC, can play a role, but I also think that companies can take a lead. The companies that really get this can start a lead and say, you know, we're creating the standard, and then other companies can join us. I mean, there's um. In a different field, but similar, you know, Natura, which is obviously a Brazilian cosmetic company, they're one of the first ones to come up with integrated reporting, sustainability reporting. They did it before anybody else pushed them to do it, right? They, they did it because they thought it was important to do. So I think we need more leadership from companies and, and, and executives and boards um, to say, okay, you know, this may not be a perfect metric and maybe there we can improve, but here it is. Let, we're going to start to put this out. Yeah, I, th I think the metric should be, you know, analyze, uh, maybe that's what I think, in two ways. The number itself, it doesn't tell you 
a lot of things. I, I you know, it's 200 times, 300, 500, 1000. I mean, uh, it tells you, but it can be tricky. I would look at the number, you know, the evolution of the number throughout the years. I think this is, would be more fair. You know, if you had a 200 10 years ago and now you have 1000, I don't know, th this is weird. Um, why? I would question why. And, the, and then compare between companies and, and each reality of each company. Like you said, you have McDonald's, the guy flipping the burger. If you look at Google, you're, gonna, you, you're not gonna have anyone with you know, a comparable job probably uh, in, in Google. So I think it's more interesting to compare between companies and make a very careful analysis and mainly compare the, the history of it, what's happening with the company. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, the other thing that you see in companies that have lower wage uh, differentials, it's not so much that somehow the, the, you know, maybe even the top didn't go down, but what happens, the bottom went up because, you know, they what these companies do is they give, per, you know, big productivity bonuses to employees, like at Nucor, you know, a third of your compensation is based on your own productivity as a team. And there's no limit. Like the more quality steel you produce, the more you get paid. And then, and then a lot of them have profit sharing, and and they're all like very big shareholders. So if the company does well, you know everybody does well. So yeah, it's not you know, this doesn't have to be a zero sum game where it's all about like let's because you know you could take maybe the differential down from a thousand to five hundred, and it's like people are still not making people at the bottom are not making anything more. So like. Does that really solve the problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. The problem I, I always see the problem is more of the basis than you know. Yeah, exactly. And and it to me, I, it's I, about more, more concerned with that, with the basis of it, the pyramid. Yeah, exactly. If and it's not just, that it's and it's one thousand, but then we had moved the basis ten times in the last five years, it's just still a great number, you know. That's exactly. And to me, it's less about redistribution of you know, you could argue that. You, everybody needs to pay a certain amount of money for, for a job. And it's, it's kind of funny um, to go off on a tangent here for a sec. There's an article in Fortune this week saying, for CEO said, oh, I'm paying my workers uh, $25 an hour in the US. The minimum wage is 12. So they're paying more than two, two, two times the minimum wage. And, and it's, it's not just the right thing to do, but it's also great because they're more productive and more motivated and more loyal. I'm like, yeah, but you know, like Henry Ford, did this in 1914, right? He did exactly the same thing. And, 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 and so like we're now discovering these things like, well, if you pay people, if you pay people more, like they're more productive and oh, yeah, you know, it's like a mystery, you know, we, we solved the big mystery. No, like <laughs> we do this all along. Anyway, so, so part of it is that, but part of it, as you say, it's not about redistributing even finite resources. It's more about how do we make everybody feel like an owner? So yeah. instead of saying, oh, let's just create this great pay package for the CEO so that he or she feels like an owner. Let's make everybody an owner, right? And, and you know, sometimes more metaphorically than literally, uh, because there may be limitations for what you can do. But to me, that's that's the way you solve the problem, right? Um, by just making everybody have real real skin in the game and an upside. And, and perhaps a point is that the greater the power and compensation differential across levels, the greater the political struggles. So you have some side effects as well from the other perspective, right? So um, perhaps we can move to Ieda, which is also a board member of uh, Sangomba and other companies. Um, buongiorno, Michele. It's a pleasure buongiorno. to see you here, uh, Michele. Um, I have a, you have the, you gave a very good examples in terms of uh, what the board can do in terms of asking the right questions. But sometimes um, you have only one person interested in the, a lot of the boards are filled with CEOs of companies that are not experimenting and not doing the same things. They're not gonna ask the question. If you are the sole person to ask the question, maybe you're not gonna get a response like you wanted. But uh, in addition to have a CEO by conviction ha or having the epiphany willing to change, or a board that is also homogeneous in asking for change. There are two other questions that I would like to ask you uh, two avenues for change. One is that uh, when you, we have this um, uh, uh, nomination and uh, committees that are uh, search for new CEOs, and uh, usually uh, companies hire headhunters and they describe the best characteristics of a CEO leadership, communication, 
leader of leaders and so on, but very seldom in the description for the job, we have this kind of a characteristic. So first thing, try to change the way that you select your CEO. For new CEOs, you have to add this humanocracy characteristics. The second point is about companies that have shareholders. You see that uh, most companies now are trying to do ESG, to describe a purpose, to do more on diversity, et cetera, because shareholders put pressures. If you didn't have uh, the BlackRock, Larry Finks, and others sending letters and pressurizing the companies, change will be much more slower. So have you had conversations with the shareholders? Because you said that you talk to CEOs, but are you talking to shareholders to change things? Yeah, we are. We're beginning conversations with shareholders. Um, and I think that they are, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Eccles. He's a, a professor at Oxford and uh, one of the founding members of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and, and also the G GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative. And you know, um, it's it, investors are only now beginning to understand the importance of employees and how the employee environment as part of ESG. We were joking with him that we should almost have another E in ESG. So it's the you know, employees environment, social and governance. Because you know, if you if you look at sort of employees within ESG, it's like I look I I did the M I looked at MSCI. You know the um they they do uh, uh, sustainability reporting, so the, I don't know they have about two hundred metrics, uh, I think forty, or, or about or maybe forty are S, so they're ESG forty about uh, I think are S out of or maybe fifty but anyway something like that and then only like ten are around employees and most of the employee metrics are very much like the one what we described you know uh, representation in boards of specific and, and, and management positions of specific groups and so on. Very little is, is around like, do people get paid for productivity? Do they, are, they, are they getting training? Are, are they, um, um, you know, um, uh, what was I gonna say? Are they, uh, yeah, do, do they have profit sharing? Things like that. They don't, they don't really have much much on that and 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 by the way then not to get too, too much in the weeds but then if you look at sort of these things get uh weighted by materiality so like employee you know the the s in, in asg is has much less weight than g and e and so like you know the the weight of even those questions which are basic questions is minimal and some of the questions you know the way they ascertain whether you you get a good score or a bad score, it's like zero and one. And so there was one, one question that MSCI had about employee involvement and I looked at, so we, you know, Nucor has a want, you know, Nucor, we have a, a, a chapter in the book about how they're all driving, you know, innovation from the bottom up. Nucor has a one, which makes sense. The other company that I won was Amazon, right? Which has 150% <laughs> turnover in their warehouses. And so, so you're like, okay, well, so how, how exactly are we defining employee, employee involvement if both, if both um, if both Amazon and Nucor have the same score, so so we're very underdeveloped, I think, um, in in the way we do that. But I think what we're trying to do is persuade, and I think we're getting somewhere. Persuade investors that this is a big deal, and and sometimes the other thing I've heard is like, yeah, we understand management is is a big deal, but we can't measure it. So like whatever, like no, you can you can actually measure it. You know, you can be disciplined in measuring certain things. And so what we're trying to do is maybe create a bit of more awareness that this is something you need to take seriously, right? I mean, even, even you know, there's the Great Places to Work uh, Institute. I'm sure there is one in Brazil that does these rankings. Most of them are private companies, not surprisingly, but they also have some public companies. And so investors are beginning to look at things like that, which is a step forward. I think there's much more we need to do, but yeah, somehow like we need, I think there's, Things are moving in the right direction, but there's a lot of convincing we still need to do. I think most people don't think that we can we can do this, but but hopefully we'll persuade them that you know there are better ways to to measure this stuff. Yeah. But thank you for your question. It's a very very good one. Yeah. And I, I want to touch into a related yes. issue, which is. I would just, uh, I just yeah. want to to open uh, to to get this comment of uh, 
Professor uh, Michele, that uh, the relevance of employee that the investors, the shareholders are seeing right now, uh, remembers me a state of uh, Herb Kelleher, the founder of Southwest, that he said the business of business is always people, uh, yesterday, today, and forever. So the focus on employee must be much, much bigger than there is right now. If yeah. I may, just well, to put a one point, in, Prof. Uh, Michele, should we include employee satisfaction on the S, on the rating? Yeah, but it needs to be measured in a, in a standard way, because right now it's all over the place. There are all these different engagement uh, scores, you know, uh, and they're all very hard to compare. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but, but I guess having, yeah, I, I think having a, um, an, a robust engagement metric like Gallup uh, I think it would be great if we could just say, if we could just say, uh, you know, we all agree that, that, you know, these are the questions we're going to ask and this is how we're going to rate them. Right now, it's all over the place. So it's really hard to compare. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, as, I agree. And as you mentioned in a recent post that you have um, added uh, on LinkedIn, um, Michelle, uh, satisfaction is not exactly the same as of engagement, right? Engagement is commitment and enthusiasm which is different because sometimes I'm satisfied because everybody's doing very poorly. And so I have a good compensation, but I'm not I'm committed. I'm not um, engaged with um, the company. So I'd like to touch on the issue of executive turnover, which um, I think it's very important. So executive turnover uh, has increased significantly in the past decade. So there, uh, of course there is a lot of variation, but the average tenure of CEOs nowadays um, revolves around four to five years. So my question is, what is the incentive for a CEO with such an expected short tenure to carry out a, a structural cultural change uh, across the lines that you proposed in your book um, that disrupts the status quo and maybe uh, uh, are going to generate the bulk of its results over the longer term? So is a high managerial turnover an ally of bureaucracy? Yeah, it, can, it certainly can be because it just makes you more myopic. Um, I have to say though, at least the data I looked at for the US, it may be different in Brazil, but um, executive turnover has actually been in decline over the last 10 years. Uh, the average age of the CEO has gone up. Um, and I think we even have these numbers in the book, but I really recently reran the analysis and the numbers are just increasing. Um, and even, even with the pandemic, we haven't seen the kind of turnover that you might expect from a huge shock. So maybe Brazil is different. And I'm not saying that turnover is like 10 years, right? So e even if it's increased from like four to five or five to six, it's still, that's the time horizon we have to play with. So, so your point stands, but, but I do, I do, I'd be curious to see, to get your, your read on, on Brazil, because I think this, at least in the U S it's, it's going the other way. Um, I would say that it is, you know, it's no accident that the companies that, that, that we study in the book had a transformative leader for a long time who could, could create the kind of environment, right, that, that, um, that, uh, that, that could then sustain itself. So at higher, Jean Grumman has been there since the, since the 90, late 80s. You know, Kelleher was at Southwest Airlines for decades. You know, at, at Nucor, Kev Iverson was there for, you know, the formative CEO was there for a long time. And so they created a system that, you know, even then when they left, they kind of could, could persist. So, you know, a lot of CEOs don't have that luxury and they're, they're transforming their company in a different way. That said, um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, there are ways to start to create change that is then hard to reverse by involving everyone in the organization and starting simply and creating almost this like irresistible movement. Um, and you can get results, like you don't have to wait five years for the results. So you, you, you can start to get results in a year and that builds momentum. And then you, and Michelin is a very good example of that, right? So Michelin started from like, um, from basically, you know, standing start and, and they're, they're, we just talked to the, the CEO of Michelin, a new CEO, by the way. So the, the person that was behind, well, he actually wasn't really that much behind because he wasn't really leading the transformation. He was supporting it. But he, he retired or moved on to become CEO of Renault, I think. And the new CEO is kind of continuing the, the trans transformation. And so, but it's the, the reason why it's continuing is because it's very organic on the one hand. So you can create this, 
kind of organic self-sustaining movement by starting from the bottom and then kind of working laterally across the organization. So lots and lots of people are involved and it's really hard to shut things down. Number one, the other thing that is important of the Michelin story is that, you know, they started with a very, back to your point, a very moral, deeply moral conviction. Like this is the right thing to do. Even if I don't see it through in my tenure, I am glad I contributed to this change in trajectory. The, 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 the head of um, uh, personnel and Michelin, it was you know help, helpful in getting started. Said, "We are at the risk of losing our soul, right? <laughs> you know, and it's like a very striking thing to say, and that's really what drove them. You know, they're a very Catholic company, Michelin. You know, based in uh, the middle of France, and 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 so they still had a little bit of that uh, kind of moral uh, moral kind of resonance." But but it, it, it was really important to them, right? And so that helps sustain it irrespective of who's the CEO. Fantastic. Well, Michelle, uh, we know you have a very tight schedule. We have uh, agreed for one hour. And as far as I know, you also have another event starting in a couple of hours, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's all, it's all, I'm, I'm happy to stay on if you, if you want, but I'm also happy to adjourn, whatever you want to, whatever you want to do. Uh, yeah, so if it's possible, would appreciate very much. So I, I have one um, um, short question. Do you know the case of Semco in Brazil uh, from the, in the 80s and 90s that they did a lot of these things? And also um, perhaps for the future, we have some interesting cases here. And even in this group, we have here uh, Luis Alexander, who is the chairman of the board of um, a, a, his family owned company, who did a lot of these things in the 80s and 90s and which is called a, 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 what's the name? It's a network company. And so um, perhaps for the future, there is a, an invitation to know some other cases from different uh, um, places such as uh, Brazil. So um, what do you know from, from Semco and, 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 and in the sense that uh, do you think it's a, a valuable experience as well? Yeah, no, uh, we've interacted with Ricardo Semler. Um, he's an amazing thinker and, and leader. Um, I know he's now still trying to act uh, active in, in spreading the Semco model. He has a Sem Semco Institute and he's working in different parts of the world to get more companies to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it shows that it can be done uh, and it's, it's, very, it's very profitable uh, and successful. I mean, the, uh, my, um, my question and my re regret is that it hasn't really scaled very far. I don't think it has scaled um, in Brazil. Um, maybe it inspired up a few companies, but you know, maybe not so many. And and then and then more broadly, you know, it was a bit of a sensation, right? People, oh, this is really interesting, and 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 so on. And that's what often happens, right? These you, you show companies that do things differently, and they're almost treated like um, exotic animals at a zoo, right? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting company. I want to learn more about it, but then you're like, oh, okay, it's it, but you know, whatever. I move on. And, and so that's why we're very focused on the principles and like, because I, you know, the book would have failed, at least from my perspective, had there been just a parade of interesting case studies, because that's, there, you know, some of these cases, as you say, you know, Semco has been around for a long time. Uh, Gore has been around for a long time. Nugor has been around for a long time. Um, so it's not like we don't have cases. The question is like, how do we how do we get more companies to embrace them and scale them, right? And what are the challenges to doing that? Um, so, but yeah, I know it's an amazing company. The other company that, and I'd love to learn more about uh, this other company that you mentioned, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, represented by someone on on the call it's, today. It's it's, it's 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 named Algar, and it has how many employees nowadays, um, Alexander? It's uh, how many thousands employees? Uh, it's a lot. Huh? Yeah, today we have about uh, eighteen thousand employees. So it's uh, great. And no, I'd love to. I'd love to hear that. There's another company in Brazil. I'm forgetting on the name. Um, that does online recruiting. Oh, I'm yeah, Japan. It's, va it's Vagas. 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 Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we had a yeah. Possiamo fare questa conversazione insieme? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked to, um, I forget the name of the gentleman that founded it, but he came to a conference of ours five, six years ago, and oh. it, it was great. And um, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's actually really interesting. Some of the most um, uh, interesting examples of, of post-bureaucratic organizations are outside of the 
developed world, you know, the US and Europe. I think there's more energy, more interest and more ambition. Um, there's another company in Russia that uh, we didn't talk about in the book, but I'm doing research on right now, which is a supermarket chain. Um, 30,000 people, two levels of management, you know, self-managing stores with profit sharing and amazingly successful. Um, and, uh, you know, they read Gary Hamill's uh, article in Morningstar, which is a tomato processor. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with that. We talk about it a little bit in the book. And they said, I want to create a company like that, but like in retail. So, so it can be done. And I'm very open to getting the best cases from Brazil and learning more. So let's definitely follow up on that. Um, and, yes, and we, last, did. Last. we have we have here also the, the Mercur that is a rubber uh, production uh, in the south part of Brazil. And there's the, also the Mercur and the Senko cases. They have these leaders that had this personal epiphany that, that you said. So it started with the leadership, with this personal and very strong experience. So maybe this is the key. <laughs> uh, and, and last week, we had a conversation with um, two executives who are bringing the Burtzorg model to Brazil. So Burtzorg mm -hmm. from Netherlands, they're bringing to Brazil. They're ex kind of expanding. It's a collaboration. And so there are some interesting things uh, going on. I don't know if we have uh, any more questions from our group. Otherwise, I'll, I'll make use of the opportunity and make my last question, if, if, if it's possible, uh, Michelle. Can, can I do it? Yeah. Do, do we have time unless, for, uh, okay. unless unless other people have other questions? Yeah, sure. I'm, I can <laughs> I can stay on for I can stay on for another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so, humanocracy departs from this critical premise uh, that we must trust employees, uh, including those from the front lines, uh, in terms of their decision making capability, their self motivation, and their ethics. But the problem is that the typical uh, 20th company starts from the diametrically opposite um, premise that employees are usually incapable of making decisions that they work to want to work as little as possible and that they are often unethical. So my question is, do you believe from your interactions around the world that most business leaders indeed have this positive view of human beings? Because we're talking about world views. And if not, do you believe that they would be willing to revisit their mental models uh, on this issue and to invest on trust and so how, how do you see this in your interaction? Because this is something very deep, right? The way we see human beings. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. Um, I think, I mean, I think people are most, mostly well-intentioned. I don't think anybody would say, well, my, my employees are lazy and they just, I mean, there may be some companies like that where they're still operating with like theory X of like the 1950s and 60s. I think most people are, you know, kind of have evolved their thinking beyond that. But that said, you know, they, they would still, still say, you know, people are greatest asset. You know, you, know, you have these kinds of statements, which, <laughs> or, you know, people are greatest resources, which yeah, I, I guess that's, you know, in a way better than saying they're not important, but but they do reflect still this kind of instrumental kind of view of people and the organization. So one of the things that we talk about in I think the first chapter is, is that you kind of have to flip that, right? So it's not the people who are the tools, the resources, because if that's your orientation, if people are the tools at the service of the organization, then even if you're well-intentioned, you're always gonna end up with an instrumental approach, which is about control and getting more out of them and whatever, right? What we think, and these organizations we profile in the book, they start with, they flip that around and say, the, the tool is the organization, not the people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's what we use as human beings to you know, improve our lives as people working for that organization, in that organization, as well as the lives of the people that, are, that we serve as part of that organization. And so I don't think most, so most CEOs would, you know, are more enlightened and, you know, they would say people are not bad and, you know, whatever, but unless they make that fundamental, I, I think they still though think very instrumentally about people and what need, they still have to make that shift and say, no, 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 okay. The challenge isn't getting more out of my people. The challenge is getting an organization, create an organization that allows people, right, to give mm -hmm. their best. So I think, you know, hopefully we're changing some minds but I, I think and it is it is kind of a subtle but powerful thing, you know, and, and hopefully we'll 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 make progress on that. Um, because I think there's more receptivity to it 
because of ESG, because of the things we talked about earlier, I think there's more, some of it is sort of fully convinced, you know, fully like authentic, some of it maybe not so much, but irrespective of that, there's more receptivity for, for kind of dealing with employees in a, in a different way. So I'm hopeful, yeah, um, yeah. I'm hopeful. So, and to be more fulfilling for them and uh, to leave a legacy, a better legacy. So um, Yeda, uh, do, do, do you wanna make the last question? No, I already have. I forgot oh, to. Oh, okay. Sorry Just because you're, you're, because... you're okay. I'm sorry. Uh, allora, Michele, una volta di più, vorrei ringraziarvi. Uh, uh, a Thais, a Thais, Thais has, has Thais, a question. Thais. Please, Thais. Oh, well, can I make it really quick? <laughs> um, <laughs> as far as I could get about your analysis, changing is a matter of surveillance for most companies. Uh, and it is a change toward a more monocratic model. When you see a revolution, I think what we generally see is not that companies change. Regularly, they disappear, the ones who are in the old model, and new companies occupy their place. So by, from your perspective, because we're so much inserted in this marketing and watching people trying to change, would you guess that most people most companies will disappear and new companies will come or that there's, a, there's really the possibilities that big companies will change? That's a very good question. Um, there are two issues with the hope of new companies upstaging the old ones. Um, one is new companies, as they get bigger and older, they become like the ones they're trying to replace. The second problem, and this is kind of shocking. Um, I just I just ran these numbers. Um, the the level of turnover between it, in companies. So if you look at the Fortune 100, so the largest U.S. companies by revenue, and you look at how long they stayed on that list, okay, what you find is that in the in 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 2000, there were uh, 45 out of 100 companies that had been on the list for the previous 10 years. The number has been increasing over time, and now it's like 66, almost 70%. So the companies that were on the list in 2019, 2020, even with the pandemic, most of them, the two thirds, were there for the previous 10 years. So these companies basically have gotten so big and so entrenched that it's gonna take a lot of time for them to get off you know, that list. And so to me, the challenge for, and we can debate the reasons for why. I mean, a lot of it is because not because they're great performing, like IBM is on that list, General Electric is on that list. They're just large, large, large companies entrenched. And it's just, you know, and they're, you know, they're, they have market power and other things. So, so for me, like, you know, the challenge is, yeah, let's hope, let's nurture new companies to have new DNA. I think that's very important, but I still feel like we got to challenge existing companies to do better because they're still so important in our economy. They have so many people working there that they, they allocate so much capital, trillions of dollars every year. And if we could even make a small percentage improvement of how those, you know, those people and that capital gets, gets used, I think we can have, you know, a, a more dynamic economy and, you know, more equal society and, you know, more fulfilled people. So, so I, I accept your point. I think that's, it's true, but I, I think we also gotta. I, I still feel like because of those reasons, we gotta we gotta work on on the problem of how do we do bureaucratize large, large uh, established uh, organizations. Wow, fantastic! So, uh, on behalf of the group, um, uh, Michelle, uh, I would like to deeply thank you once again for your generosity, above all, and for taking your time to be with us. È stata una occasione memorabile per tutti noi, uh, veramente memorabile. And it will be a privilege uh, to hopefully meet you once again at some point yeah. in the future. Uh, allora, grazie mille. Grazie, uh, grazie tanti. Yeah, grazie, grazie. Grazie. Fu un prazer e a te a prossima. Grazie, ciao. Ciao, bye. Ciao, ciao, ciao. ciao.